Cannabis is very fast to enter the bloodstream. In fact, within 30 seconds, it's going to enter the brain and permeate throughout the brain and body. That's very, very fast. I mean, we contrast that with something like alcohol or even nicotine, depending on how the nicotine is delivered. That is a very fast delivery of the psychoactive and biologically active compound. So within 30 seconds, it reaches the brain and bodily tissues. And within 30 to 60 minutes, it's going to reach its peak concentrations and have its peak biological effects. And the effects tend to last anywhere from three to four hours, although there's some variation on that depending on individual metabolism, whether or not somebody is familiar with the compound, believe it or not, psychologically familiar, but also biologically familiar, or whether or not it's a first time use or occasional use and so on. THC and CBD and the other components of cannabis are highly lipophilic. So they can get into essentially all cells just simply by flowing into them. They will also remain in those cells for a long time. Don't take this as a strict number, but typically if one ingests CBD or THC, it's gonna stay in that fatty tissue and can be detected for at least as long as 80 days after ingestion. And there's a whole industry as to you know, how to accelerate the clearance. Just losing bodily fat isn't going to eliminate it from your system, maybe partially in those fat cells, but intravisceral fat and other fatty tissue that's in and around the brain and body is going to harbor that THC molecule and the CBD molecule for quite a long while, at least 80 days. When somebody smokes or ingests cannabis, doesn't matter what the THC or CBD ratio is. If they experience deficits in memory, and that's almost always present, that's going to be because of reductions in electrical activity within this brain region we call the hippocampus. Okay, hippocampus means seahorse, it's shaped like a seahorse. Hippocampus memory, memory is reduced in particular short-term memory. That's true regardless of whether or not one is using sativa, indica, or some hybrid. In general, the prefrontal cortex is going to be activated by the sativa varieties, which is going to increase thinking and narrowly constrain focus to some activity. And that's more commonly associated with the sativa varieties. The indica varieties, as I mentioned before, tend to lead to a suppression of activity in prefrontal cortex, believe it or not, and you know, turn off thinking and planning. This is why indica varieties are often used for relaxation and for promoting sleep. Regardless of whether or not sativa or indica variety, and again, regardless of the ratio of THC to CBD, there is a general suppression of neural circuits within the so-called basal ganglia and cerebellum. Basal ganglia and cerebellum are areas of the brain that are involved in action planning and withholding action. So that would be the basal ganglia, so-called go, no-go circuitry. And the cerebellum, which is involved in balance, but also motor planning and motor sequencing. This is why people who smoke marijuana, regardless of the strain, will tend to be less physically mobile. Other common effects are reddening of the eyes, dryness of the mouth. That's actually caused by the same general mechanism, which is a reduction in the secretion of saliva and tears and lubrication of the eyes from the lacrimal glands of the eyes because of the presence of largely CB2, but also CB1 receptors in the mouth and on the eyes. And there tends to be, especially with certain strains of cannabis, increase in appetite, so-called munchies. And that has everything to do with very, very high density of CB1 receptors in the hypothalamus, and in particular areas of the hypothalamus, like the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus, other areas as well, of course, that have tons of CB1 receptors, bind THC and CBD, and activate the neurons that strongly stimulate appetite through two mechanisms. One is a cognitive mechanism of creating a preoccupation with food and anticipation of taste, as well as the experience of taste. So the narrowing of focus to what you want to go eat, right? You really crave pizza and narrowing of focus so that you're not thinking about anything else, but also signaling from the hypothalamus to the gut, to neurons within the stomach itself that regulate blood sugar. So there are strong effects on blood sugar of THC and CBD that generally lead to increases in appetite. So two parallel mechanisms, one within the brain, one within the body, increasing appetite. Okay, so there's an array of different effects. And as I mentioned before, CB1 receptors are present all over the nervous system in the brain, the spinal cord. In fact, the presence of CB1 receptors in the spinal cord largely explains the fact that THC and CBD to some extent, although it's not very well studied, can provide some pain relief. I should say some because a lot of people perceive or believe that they experience more pain relief from cannabis than they actually do. It actually has a lot to do with a perceptual shift to basically focusing on other things, but there does seem to be some anti-nociceptive, meaning anti-pain effects 
of cannabis, THC in particular, and that is exerted largely through effects on CB1 receptors in neurons of the spinal cord.